Hey, 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 my friends. It's the Frizz. Here we are. It's another day, another exciting day of no school. What are we going to do? So I am super excited to be here. And today is a very fabulous day for reading. So I'm going to get my magic book bag. Remember, we got do, 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 my magic, my magic book bag from my friend at Pouches for Pooches here in Miles City. All right, so let's see what we got in here. Hmm, what do we have here? Ta-da! Magic School Bus Explores the Senses. What does that mean? All right, here we go. <clears throat> the Magic School Bus Explores the Sentence. What does that cover look like? Looks like a big eyeball to me. Let's see if that's really what it is. All right, The Magic School Bus Explores the Senses by Joanna Cole and Bruce Dagan, published by Scholastic. Remember, none of this is for profit. It's merely for service. Okay. The Magic School Bus. Uh-oh. This looks like lots of fun. All right. We got more fun pages. All right, this one's got lots and lots of words, so this might take a little bit longer. Our class was studying the senses, how people and animals know what's going on around them. We were doing experiments and writing reports. We were even learning a song about the senses. To sing at an important parent-teacher meeting, the day before the meeting, we practiced our song 20 times. Do you know how many fingers is 20 times? Should we do that together? Whoa. And then another 10. That's a lot of singing. Okay. <clears throat> so here's our first report. I'll read it to you. Without our senses, we'd be out of it. If someone could not see, hear, could not taste or smell, that person would not be able to tell anything about the outside world. So here is the song. Hear a school bell ring, see a bright light shine, touch a cat's soft fur, you'll be just in time to come to your senses. It had been easier if it would have been easier if we had an ordinary teacher, but we don't. We have Miss Frizzle, who's crazy. Looking at her dress for made, a, made us forget the tune. Her shoes made us forget the words, and her wacky personality made us forget almost everything else. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So here's that page. Look at her dress. She has clocks on her dress. And then she's got sundials on her shoes, which is how people used to tell time with shadows. Okay. Class, the show is tomorrow evening. Taste a school bell ring. Smell a bright light shine. Somehow I don't think we're going to be ready. So here's another paper. Every animal needs senses. Without senses, an animal could not find food, 
or escape from danger. That's scary. Even the tiniest of animals have senses. One-celled animals have simple senses. They can tell when their surroundings are too hot, too cold, or too poisonous. Then they turn around and they go the other way. See that little, there we go. When the school day was over, we went outside to warm up for a game. After a while, Miss Frizzle came out and got in her car. I'm going to turn this a little bit. I know it's kind of hard to see, so I'll show you the pictures and we'll just wing it. After a while, Miss Frizzle came out and got in her car. At the same moment, Mr. Wild, our new assistant principal, called to us. See you at the meeting tonight. Tonight? We groaned. Miss Frizzle thinks it's tomorrow. I have to tell her, said Mr. Wild, but it was too late. The Frizz was already driving away. All right, so let's look at those pictures. What do we got going on here? What do you bet they're going on an adventure? Okay, so here's another uh, book report. Which senses are most important? Different kinds of animals to, uh, rely on different senses. Seeing is most important for birds. They can't find food if they can't see it. I think that is for humans too. So how do we see? With our eyeballs. And we have two eyeballs. Yeah. All right. Bats use hearing to tell them where they're going. They can't hunt if their ears are blocked. So where are your ears? Right here and right here. And how many ears do we have? Two. Snakes oof, smell the air with their forked tongues. If a snake's tongue isn't working, it's hard for it to find its prey. Which may not be a bad thing if their prey is a human. All right. So we have Mr. Wild, the assistant principal. He's trying to drive the bus. And the kids are like, eh, I don't know about that. It's maybe not going to work. We'll see what happens, right? I have got to catch up with Miss Frizzle, said Mr. Wild. To our surprise, he got behind the wheel of our bus. Believe us, we've had a lot of experience with that bus. We couldn't let Mr. Wild drive it, not all by himself. After all, he's only the assistant principal. He's not Miss Frizzle. So we all jumped on board. So come back, Miss Frizzle. So you can see here's, so the bus was over here and here's Miss Frizzle in her own little car. Okay. So here is another poem or another report. Our top senses, seeing and hearing, are the two most, most important senses for humans. So let's practice. How do we see? With our eyes. And how do we hear? With our ears. See, I have funky earrings in my ears. All right. As Miss Frizzle went faster, some papers blew out of her car. They were her teacher's notes about the senses. They came flying in the windows of our bus, and we saved them for her. Mr. Wilde drove carefully out of the parking lot. We were only a few cars behind the Frizz. We would catch up to her in no time. Look at all this craziness that's going on. You see all that? All 
Then Mr. Wilde saw a little green switch on the dashboard. Green means go, he muttered to himself, reaching for the switch. Don't touch it, he warned. But it was too late. Mr. Wilde flipped the switch. He had never been in a school bus like this one before. Should have read his job description a little bit better. But we had plenty of times. We knew that something impossible was going to happen. And it did. The bus began to shrink. Let me see. Craziness, I tell ya. Okay. So here's some more reports. What makes your eyes move? There are six muscles attached to each of your eyeballs. They move the eyes in different directions. Up and down and side to side. And then there's another thing that says owls can't move their eyes. So they have to turn their heads to look around. So that means I couldn't look that way. If I was an owl, I would have to actually turn and look. That's kind of weird. All right. Oh, here we go. Here's the magic eyeball. The bus shrank until it was no bigger than a speck of dust. A stiff breeze started up and blew us into the air. Ahead, we saw a big blue circle. In the middle of the circle was a black dot. This was a giant eye. The eye belonged to a police officer, and we blew right into it. You see them blowing right into that ear? I mean, I. Miss Frizzle needs to get her senses right. Okay, so here's another report. Your iris is a muscle, so that's in the middle of your eye, but your pupil is nothing at all. The dark spot in the middle of your iris is actually an opening into your eye. The pupil, your pupil is protected by a tough, clear layer called the cornea. Before the officer could blink us out, Mr. Wild saw a rainbow-colored lever. Leave the lever alone, we yelled. But he couldn't resist. He pulled the lever. And the bus slid smoothly through the cornea, the clear covering that protects the iris and the pupil. Behind the cornea, we passed through a sea of clear liquid, past the blue iris, and through the pupil. Who knew driving a bus was so much fun? <laughs> Little did he know. Iris comes from a word that means rainbow. A rainbow has lots of colors. Colors. Irises come in many colors. So you, the eye color of your eyes, those are the iris colors. So you can have brown eyes, black eyes, blue eyes, hazel eyes, green, or gray. What color of eyes do you have? Miss Frizzle has green eyes. You just kind of can't see them. And here is a frizzle fact for you. When the muscles of the iris tighten, the um, pupil gets smaller. Then less light enters your eye. When the muscles relax, the pupils get larger. More light gets in. So when you're sleeping at night and you, or you're in a dark room, your eyes will get bigger. If you have a light, you'll have, they'll get, the black part will get really, really small. All right, Mr. Wild, man, assistant principal who didn't do his homework before he got a job at the same school as Mrs. as Miss Frizzle. Mr. Wild was going wild. I should have been a school bus driver instead of an assistant principal, he exclaimed. As we slipped through the clear lens of the eyes, we weren't the only ones going through. Rays of light went through as well. 
The lens focused the light to make a sharp picture on the retina, a layer of cells on the back of the eye. Your eye is like a living camera. Your pupil is like the camera's aperture, which is the opening, which lets in light. Your lens is like the camera's glass lens, which focuses the light. Your retina is like the film, which changes when light hits it. You can see all the pictures of the eye. Pretty cool, huh? Let's go to the retina, said Mr. Wilde, gunning the engine. There was no stopping him now. The teacher's notes said the retina is made up of special cells called rods and cones. These cells change the light that falls on them. The pattern of light becomes a pattern of nerve signals going to the brain. It's like translating one language into another, said Tim. The rods and cones translate light language into nerve language. It's kind of some big words. Mr. Wilde had forgotten all about delivering his message to the Frizz. All he cared about was driving the bus. All he cared about, all we cared about, was finding Miss Frizzle. Keisha flipped through the teacher's notes, trying to figure out where we were. Look, here's a map of the retina, she said. The spot in the center of the retina is the, f is the fovea. That's the part of the eye we use when we look directly at something. The fovea is covered with cone cells, only cone cells. They are good for seeing sharply. What's the other round spot on the retina? We asked. It's called the blind spot, answered Keisha. Everyone is blind in that little spot of the eye. It's where all the nerves in the eye come together. They form a bundle called the optic nerve which runs from the eye to the brain. A smile spread over Mr. Wilde's face as he steered the bus into the optic nerve. We rolled out onto the surface of the brain. We have to keep track of the frizz, said Ralphie. Look for the part, that part of the cortex. Let's get mes messages from the eyes. Everyone scrambled off the bus and spread out. Wanda came from the back of the brain. Here it is. We ran to join Wanda on the vision center of the brain. Somehow we saw what Officer, Officer Jones saw. So now they're in the brain. Your brain is not just for thinking. A thin wrinkled layer covers your brain like the rind of a watermelon. This is called the cerebral cortex. Different parts of the cortex let you think, talk, remember, move, see, hear, taste, smell, and touch. So here's another fun frizzle fact. You can't see with your eyes alone. You need your brain too. There was Miss Frizzle in a dress shop buying a dress with an optical illusion on it. We called for help, but of course she couldn't hear us. We didn't know that Mr. She didn't know that Mr. Wilde was driving the bus. She didn't know that her class was in a brain. She didn't know that everything was totally out of control. And we couldn't tell her. It's kind of a predicament. Okay. Then we felt something rumbling. Officer Jones was on his motorcycle riding away. He had to stay close to the frizz. We jumped on the bus or we had to stay close to Miss Frizz. 
We jumped on the bus and Mr. Wilde swerved back onto the path of nerves that led to the eye. Our bus teetered on the edge of the eyelid, then dropped through the eyelashes. When we looked down, we saw an ear. We were falling into the ear of a little kid who was looking in a toy store window. We went straight into his ear canal. Whoosh! We slid all the way down. At the end of the ear canal, we hit a thin, stretchy membrane called the eardrum. We came tumbling out of the bus. Just as sound, some sound waves entered the ear, they made the eardrum vibrate. We vibrated right along through the eardrum and into the middle ear. So did our bus. There was nothing in the middle ear except air and three ossicles, small bones that carry sound vibrations. Sound waves traveled from one bone to the next. We went too, and the bus rolled behind us. Then we came to another stretchy membrane. This one was called the oval window. This last ossicle, the stirrup, was resting right on top of it. Dorothy Ann read from Miss Frizzle's notes, Children, the oval window separates the middle ear from the inner ear. Inner ear, here we come, shouted Wanda. As we went through, we were going to the inner ear whether we liked it or not. So far, oh wait, sorry. Almost forgot to show you the picture. So far, all the parts of the ears had only one job, to carry vibrations. In the inner ear, we saw the part that receives vibrations, the colloquia. We swam through liquid inside the colloquia. We saw cells that looked like tiny hairs. Miss Frizzle's notes said, hair cells are sound receptors. They translate sound vibrations into nerve signals. As soon as we were on the bus again, Mr. Wilde followed the nerve singles, signals along the auditory nerve. This book. This one has lots of big words. Some of you little people might not understand all of it. Miss Frizzle didn't realize this one was so in depth. All right. This time we went to a different part of the cortex. As soon as we were standing on it, we could somehow hear what the little kid heard. It was Miss Frizzle reading from her things-to-do list. She was nearby. Maybe there was still hope. Maybe the Frizz could rescue us. Then we heard heels clicking on the sidewalk. Sidewalk. They were Miss Frizzle's heels. She was walking away. <laughs> we had to follow her, so we ran for the bus. We sped over the brain into the auditory nerve, through the ear, and out the ear canal. When we started falling, this time there was no soft ear to catch us. When we saw the hard sidewalk rushing up at us, then just before our bus crash, something amazing happened. A friendly dog smelling her way along Main Street sniffed us right up. At first, we were happy because we were safe. Then the full impact of our situation hit us. We were inside a dog's nose? This is a nightmare. It's too slimy. We'll never find Miss Frizzle now. Miss Frizzle wisdom. Never say never. Dogs can smell odors that are very, very faint or very, very far away. Bloodhounds can tell one person from another just from the scent that comes through their shoes. That's awesome. Dogs get a lot of information just by smell. In the dog's nose, we saw tunnels of bone, all coated with special receptors. Miss Frizzle noted, when the dog breathes, molecules come in with the air. They stick to the small smell cells in the nose then the nose sends messages to smell areas in the dog's brain.
Mr. Wilde drove to one of the smell areas. Then he could smell what the dog smelled. It was easy to tell what he could smell. We were close to a pizza restaurant. Miss Frizzle loves pizza a lot. Okay, so here's a little activity for you to do. Try this at home. Smell something nice. Now sniff. Is the small is the smell stronger? That's because more odor went into your smell patches. So when you smell a good thing that your mom or dad or caregiver has made for dinner, you might smell it if you're upstairs playing in your room or in another room, but then you go in the in the kitchen and you sniff it. And you think, oh, that smells yummy. I want that in my tummy. So that's how your nose works. Let's get out and have some pizza, said Mr. Wilde. For once, we all approved of his plan. We drove out of the brain and back to the nose. Just then, the dog sneezed and the bus flew out. Through the windows, we saw the frizz sitting at a table. Splash down. We landed right in her water glass. The bus got a good washing. It needed one. Then a waiter accidentally knocked over the glass. We were tossed into Miss Frizzle's pizza. Mr. Wilde tried to get away, but the pizza had extra cheese. While we were spinning our wheels, the frizz decided to take a bite. Oh, she's going to eat them. We'd been chewed out by teachers before. Oh, hold on. I forgot to show you this part. We'd been chewed out before by teachers, but this was ridiculous. We had to escape fast. Mr. Wilde gunned the engine and the bus lurched out of the cheese and onto Miss Frizzle's tongue. It was covered with bumps. Between the bumps were deep gaps. Looking down into one, we saw food molecules being washed into the taste buds by saliva. Then a wave of it swept us down too. So, do taste buds work better when they're wet or when they're dry? They work better when they are wet. Food molecules dissolve in the liquid. Then they easily slide down between the bumps on your tongue. Hmm. We could have hidden out in the gap until Miss Frizzle finished chewing, but that must have seemed too boring to Mr. Wilde. He had school bus fever. He hung a sharp left into one of the taste buds. The taste bud cells inside the bud were changing the tastes into nerve messages. So here's, here's some fun facts. Your sense of smell helps your taste. Or helps you taste. When you chew food, or when you chew, food molecules go into the air in your mouth. Then the air flows up the back of your throat and into your nose. When your nostrils are closed, the air cannot flow. That's why you may not taste much when you have a cold. Have you ever experienced that? It's kind of weird. All right. Before we were knew, before we knew it, we were traveling on a pathway of nerves to a taste area of Miss Frizzle's brain. We climbed off the bus and stood on her taste cortex. Mm, that sounds fancy. We climbed off the bus and stood on her taste cortex. Now we could taste what our teacher tasted. Whew, this is our fourth visit into the brain. We thought we loved, we'd love the taste of Miss Frizzle's pizza, but yuck, it was covered with anchovies. If you don't know what anchovies are, they're like little miniature fish. 
We were so grossed out that we ran away from the taste area of the brain as fast as we could. Luckily, Mr. Wild followed us in the bus. We ended up on the part of the brain that gets touch messages from the hand. Once we were standing on it, we felt some, we could somehow feel what Miss Frizzle felt. When she left something hot or cold or so, hard or soft, we did too. Let's see where this nerve goes, said Mr. Wild. Back on the bus, we zoomed along the nerve pathways leading away from Miss Frizzle's brain. At the end of the nerves were the receptor cells in her skin. Okay. So, see that little cat? Right here? We're going to read about him. Whiskers are touch organs. Cats, dogs, mice, horses, and many other mammals have sensitive whiskers. Whiskers help animals find their way in the dark. A whisker may also detect food that the animal doesn't see. Oh, here we go. Here's our exit, said Mr. Wild, driving out through a pore in the skin. Up ahead, we saw Frizz petting her mom's nice stuff cat. Mr. Wild drove so fast that the bus flew right off Miss Frizzle's hand and into the cat's inner ear. Hmm. Do you see them moving? Craziness. We passed the snail-shaped cochlea used for hearing. Then we came to some hollow tubes. They are used for balancing. We hung on for dear life as we felt the cat jump. Next, we heard the rumble of a car engine. Seatbelts, everyone, said Miss Frizzle, and off we went. When the frizz made a sudden swerve, we were catapulted out of the ear. We landed in the road behind Miss Frizzle's car. As the bus grew to its regular size again, Mr. Wild beeped the horn. Beep, beep. And Miss Frizzle pulled over. Mr. Wild, it's my class. What a coincidence. We told Miss Frizzle about the meeting, and in no time we were all on our way back to school. You must be Arnold. I've heard so much about you. Miss Frizzle, you'll never believe this bus. Never say never, Mr. Wild. We got there just in time to sing our song and check out the refreshment table. Then, what a surprise, Miss Frizzle got an award. If anyone deserves an award, it's the Frizz. She's the most sensational teacher in the school. Here's the song. We can taste and we can smell. We can balance very well. We like to see and hear and touch. We like our senses very much. You can see all the proud parents and the grandparents, caregivers. We are so proud of you. Where will Miss Frizzle take us next? That's the big question. You never know where the frizz may go. Look at all these crazy people. They're all singing crazy songs. In this whole nutty book, is there anything true? Yes, the science is real. So let's shout wahoo! The end! Woohoo! We made it. That was kind of long. Miss Frizzle should have had a drink of water before that one. All right.
We got one more. This is a fan favorite from my friends in second grade here in Miles City. If you watched the pilot episode, I talked about this book. It's one of my favorites. And I happen to know that there's some special friends of mine who I love very much who are watching from Colorado. And their dad happens to be my brother. So this book is one of our absolute favorites. So I have a feeling some of you grownups are going to recognize it too. Dun, 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 dun. Henry. Henry's awful mistake. So let me tell you a little story about this one before I actually tell you the story. So when I took this, when I took this book to second grade, this was right around, it was at Christmas. <clears throat> and so I always like to read a magic school bus book. And then I read a book for my personal collection. Well, I also like to read books that teach good life lessons. And so we, in preparation for Santa, we decided to talk about making good choices. And our example of maybe not making the best choices in life was Henry. So this is a great book. So I hope you all enjoy it. It's one of my faves and yeah, we'll just laugh at it together. All right. Henry's Awful Mistake by Robert Quackenbush. Do you think that's his real name? Okay, so this one is published by Parents Magazine Press out of New York. Henry's Awful Mistake. <sighs> the day Henry the Duck asked his friend Clara over for supper, he found an ant in the kitchen. This might actually be kind of common here in Montana during the summer. Henry was worried that Clara would see the ant. She might think his house wasn't clean. The ant had had to go. Henry reached for a can of ant spray, but he didn't want to spray near the food he was cooking. So he chased the ant with a frying pan. Henry ran around the kitchen chasing after the ant, but the ant got away and it hid behind the stove. Henry took the food he was cooking off the stove. Then he shut off the flame and pulled the stove away from the wall. He saw the ant. The ant saw Henry and ran into a small crack in the wall. Henry went and got a hammer. Uh-oh. I don't think. Henry pounded a big hole in the wall where the crack was, but he couldn't find the ant. So he kept pounding. Not very good life choices, Henry. The hole got bigger and bigger. At last, Henry saw the ant sitting on a pipe inside the wall. This isn't going to end well. Henry aimed the hammer at the ant 
and missed. The blow of the hammer broke the pipe. What do you think is coming next? Water came shooting out of the pipe. Henry couldn't stop it. I'll bet he now had a much bigger problem. Ugh. Poor life choices, Henry. Henry grabbed a towel. He tied it around the pipe and the water stopped shooting out. <laughs> but Henry hadn't stopped this water soon enough. It had sprayed all over the kitchen. Everything was soaking wet, except for Clara's supper. Oh, thank goodness. Henry began mopping up the puddles of water. All at once, he slipped and banged against the kitchen table. Everything came crashing down. Henry was covered with pots, pans, and food. The supper was ruined. There was nothing Henry could do now but to call Clara and tell her not to come. I don't know where she would sit even if she did come. While Henry was talking on the telephone, the towel came loose from the pipe. The water came shooting out and flooded the whole house. Henry was carried right out the front door by the flood. There was no going back. Poor Henry's house was washed away by the flood. He saved what he could, and he moved into a new house. If only it was that easy. When Henry was settled in his new house, he again asked Clara over for supper. Just as he went to the door to let Clara in, he saw an ant. And he looked the other way. The end. Ah. All right. There you go, my friends. So we learned all about the senses. Our eyeballs, which we have two of. Our ears, which we have two. Our nose, which we can smell from. Our tongue, that we can taste. And all of those things, aren't we so grateful that we have all of our senses that we can enjoy the world around us? So, and we learned about Henry. Henry, Henry, Henry. He does not know how to make good choices. So, what can we learn from Henry? We need to make good choices. So, what does making good choices mean for you? Telling the truth doing your chores, being kind, saying I love you, not hitting your brother or your sister, and maybe a lot of other things. You know what I mean. So always remember to be kind to others and always remember sometimes we just need to make better life choices. So that we don't end up like Henry and have an awful mistake kind of day. Nobody wants to have to get a new house because they flooded it over an ant. So I love all of you. Keep reading. Keep having fun. Enjoy sunshine. Be nice to your mom and your dad or your caregiver who's trying to be a school teacher and do their parenting. Be nice to them. They're working really hard. We're all working really hard and we love you. And I hope that you love us back 
and that we will see you next time. Keep it magical, and I'll see you next time.